I'm going to be providing a practical approach for defining clinical performance specifications for new tests. So as we've heard from the previous presentations, under the new regulations, the performance evaluation reports suggest that clinical evidence is going to be required to demonstrate the intended clinical benefits will be achieved. And elsewhere in the document, the suggestion that clinical evidence should demonstrate acceptable performances. So on my reading, there's an in-principle requirement that one would specify and justify minimal clinical performance levels to achieve those benefits. And to me, that's reasonable, because I don't think anyone would argue that if evidence demonstrated unacceptable performance, say that the test was useless or the test was harmful, that it should be approved. And the problem is that we have no practical guidelines about how to distinguish between acceptable and unacceptable performance. And that's the problem that came to the test evaluation working group and the, the work that I'm presenting here. So my demonstration example of the problem is a serum biomarker proposed as a screening test. And in this example, I'm thinking that there's early clinical studies or a discovery study that's showing promising evidence that the test is associated with cancer. And then the next step is a clinical performance study in the intended population to provide some accuracy measures. And the issue there is that by itself, that information is not necessarily going to improve these health outcomes, the cancer outcomes for the patient. So I'd need information that there was an effective management. And even if there was an effective manage management, unless the test is perfectly accurate, misclassification may cause harm. So I want to know that those harms don't outweigh the benefits. And so, in short of doing a randomised controlled trial that Patrick was talking about to demonstrate the impact of that test on those health outcomes, the question is, is what level of clinical performance would be sufficiently promising to say that I've achieved, well, I've, I've, I may achieve the intended benefits. And that brings me to the definition of clinical performance specification. So it's the clinical performance level the test must demonstrate to allow the possibility of clinical benefits for patients against state-of-the-art existing tests for the same indication. And it's not a one-size-fits-all. So for some tests, modest test accuracy will be sufficient. There's an effective treatment, and we have no, we have poor or very late tests. But for others, we'll need more, well, near-perfect accuracy because we've got existing tests and the harms of misclassifications are so high that our new test to be introduced will need to um, be safe. So as an analogy for this situation of defining a bar for acceptable performance, we've got the four phases of clinical trials, um, which were introduced in the 1960s for the development and evaluation of drugs. And they were introduced at that time because that followed a period of rapid advancement in therapeutics, so anti-cancer, anti-hypertensive, anti-TB drugs. And those four phases were initially to determine, set a bar to think, we're going to set a maximum tolerated dose, so what, how would we define that? In cancer, um, that was initially, well, no more than one in three patients should have a serious adverse event, in which case, moving forward in the development of that drug to assess the safety and um, biological activity in, a, in a, a somewhat larger group of patients and setting a bar for minimum acceptable safety and activity. And in cancer, we could have set that, um, well it was traditionally set at a 20% response rate, so one in five patients shows a tumour um, benefit. And then the drug can then move forward to a randomised controlled trial to assess efficacy where it's compared against state of the art, the current practice. And there the bar is set. Um, that it should achieve minimally clinically important difference. So there's a statement about what that difference might be, and it might be very small for survival, and the evidence is provided to the regulatory agent to approve that drug on the basis of meeting that bar. And then it can go forward um, and into use and perhaps broader assessment of effectiveness and cost effectiveness where there's another bar for reimbursement. So my point in this analogy 
is that there's a benchmark set by investigators, and the goal is not that they're reaching some magical um, single point of agreement, but there's a transparent bar, and the decision about what is acceptable and not acceptable is transparent for the, the body who's making the decisions. The challenges we've heard with tests is that they're indirectly associated with health outcomes. So for that clinical performance study, if we had a perfect, accurate test, then the patient would gain all of the benefits of that management or, or avoiding that management to get those health outcomes. But we're in the situation where the test is providing us with imperfect accuracy. It might be a huge improvement, but not perfect accuracy. So that presents this trade-off between the benefits of the information and the potential harms of misclassification. And while you're probably familiar with um, the test evaluation framework, and that's what we've heard so far, what I'm going to be introducing is using the established principles, the decision and analytic principles, to consider that trade-off and to set an acceptable performance level. So the guide is broken down in five steps. Um, and it's relevant across the stages of the development of a new test, designing the clinical performance study, interpreting the results, but also for a notifiable body, a notified body, who needs to use the evidence to make decisions. The first step is defining the intended benefits of the test. So what patient, I'm asking the clinician, what patient or other benefits or the person developing the test do you hope to achieve by using the test? And that could be downstream, well, I'm going to use the test to detect the disease or, make, or um, undertake further tests, um, then treat the patients, or maybe um, just use that information to counsel patients. So that's my pathway to improving outcomes. Or it might be, we've already got a pathway with an existing test and management, and I'm going to use my test. Um, because it offers a better process than the previous test, so it's safer or more convenient or perhaps um, less costly, while not compromising the outcomes that I'm gaining from testing. So for the purpose of defining clinical performance specifications, you can categorise these intended benefits into three groups. The first one is my new test is going to improve disease outcomes. And to do that, it's got to improve detection. Or it might be the main, the main reason I want to introduce this new test is it's going to reduce harm from unnecessary tests and treatment that already happened in the pathway. I'm going to put this in the pathway and improve the rule out or avoid anything, so avoid the astrogenic harm. Or it may be that I'm going to introduce this test to provide other benefits, so improve the process, reduce the cost, without compromising the rest of the pathway. The next step is to map out the state of the art, current practice. So what group will be tested? What's the indication for the test? What's that population and settings? And the questions to defining the clinical pathway, are what tests the patients currently receive to detect the target condition? What are the actions, the main actions, that are based on those test results that have an impact on outcomes, so further tests and treatment? What are the benefits and harms of those actions? And what's the gap the new test will address? So joining the dots back from um, where this new test is expected to provide intended benefits. And then thinking about that, remapping the pathway, so I'm showing it in the vertical here, with the new test, so you've got an existing pathway with an existing test and you want to join the dots to link the, the new test with the health outcomes. So, for a positive test result, what are the actions and what are the potential benefits of a true positive and harms of a false positive? And for a negative test result, what are the actions and the benefits of a true negative and the harms of a false negative relative to what you would do in current practice? And potentially the test has got a different process, so it has that got an impact compared to the existing test on patient health outcomes. At this stage, um, you've described the intended benefits of the test, and I wanted to make a comment about the test purpose. You'll be, you'll be labelling the test purpose. 
is that the approach that I'm talking about is suitable when we can use clinical accuracy type measures to talk about clinical performance and not the types of tests like Patrick mentioned where that evidence would be provided in a treatment trial so you're leaping ahead to provide your clinical evidence from the treatment trial. So for this test to define clinical performance specifications, you're going to have a clear idea of where it's going to be in the clinical pathways they're going to replace, the test is going to be before and help for rule out or as an add-on after the um, existing tests. And here, the approach is to link those intended benefits with the clinical test accuracy requirements. And to do that, you need to be familiar with the um, measures of accuracy. And I've just got the two by two table as a recap. So in my two by two table, my example is the fecal alcohol blood test. As a, as a test for cancer screening. So I've got that test, this is the test we use in Australia. Everyone over 50 gets the test. In my study, I'm going to invite people over 50 in this group to have the test, and I'm going to count those who have a true, or will have a positive result, and I'm going to count those that have a negative result. And then in my study, everybody's going to get the reference standard, which I'm going to say is colonoscopy and a biopsy if there's a finding. And then I'm going to classify everybody who tested positive as having a true positive or a false positive, and everybody who's testing negative having a false negative or a true negative based on my reference standard. And then I've got all the information that I need to talk about clinical performance using clinical accuracy measures. So for the group that have got discovered with colorectal cancer, I'll be talking about the proportion who had a true positive result on my fecal alcohol blood test. So the, the proportion of true positives, the sensitivity of the test. And for those who didn't have colorectal cancer, I'll be going down the column and talking about the proportion of those who had a true negative result on my test, the specificity of the test. And I can also use the same data to estimate the positive predictive value. For those across the rows who had a test positive, what proportion of those were a true positive, the positive predictive value? For those with a test negative, what proportion had a true negative result? Now, with that in mind, I'm going to be working back from my intended benefits to specify the clinical performance requirements for my test. And as it happened in Australia, we got a new test, an um, immunochemical test for bowel cancer screening, and we wanted to assess whether that was um, how that compared to the old test and the intended benefits. So that new test may have been to improve disease outcomes, so improve cancer survival, uh, bowel cancer survival, in which case the requirements would be, well, that new test has got to be demonstrating. I want to demonstrate that there's more true positives. And given the positive test, it may also be false positive, I want to have an acceptable rate of false positives. In our case, our main concern and the main reason to think about new tests and what they may offer is that we didn't want so many people going to colonoscopy and having, um, having a normal result. So we wanted to reduce, um, reduce the harm of having to go for further testing because you were called um, positive. So if that was the case, this new test would need to demonstrate more true negatives without any trade-off. Um, well, or an acceptable rate of false negatives. And it could have been the situation, since the pa um, participant adherence to this study, the patient experience of the study wasn't very good, that we wanted to introduce the new test for other benefits. You didn't have to follow the dietary requirements and so on. In which case, the evidence that we'd need is to demonstrate that patients like the new test more and use the new test more without compromising on the um, positive, the false positive, or the false negative rates. So the step then is to think about, well, what, how, do we, how do we think about that possible trade-off? And I'm showing you three approaches here, which I'll go through with examples. And the approach that you choose will de depend on the intended benefits of the new test. And for the, some of these approaches, there'll be, or some of these intended benefits, there'll be a trade-off. And so you'll need to be thinking about what harm-benefit trade-off are you prepared to accept. So for example one, that's the most straightforward example, we've got a test that proposes a replacement test 
with the intended benefits to improve disease outcome, so we want to improve cancer survival, or maybe we want to improve rule out, we want to have less colonoscopies, or other benefits. We want patients to like it and use it more without compromising accuracy. So we're in a situation where we've got a new test that's promising benefits, and we're not accepting any trade-off. So as a replacement test, there's no change in the patient pathway. And the approach then is to benchmark to existing tests. So if you can demonstrate concordance with your existing test and the other benefits we're talking about, then that would suffice. Otherwise, you might be, if there's discordance, you're going to be demonstrating, needing to demonstrate that that's improved sensitivity or improved specificity. So if I had my old test with a sensitivity and a specificity and other characteristics, I'd be demonstrating that I'd be meeting those and exceeding those in, in that area that I'm claiming. So this would be, in the performance evaluation report, the benchmark against existing tests to show that you meet your intended benefits. The situation is often that, that you're introducing a new test, say as an add-on, um, in which case, um, and I'm going to use the example of the serum marker for screening. So sometimes there might not be a, a, a test already, so you've actually got a new test pathway. The existing test is no test. You're adding a new test. And the consequences for patients is no change if it's negative. They don't get any further um, management. Um, there may be a bit of a benefit with reassurance, but the major action is happening when they test positive, in which case the consequences are whether it's a true positive or a false positive. So the questions you're asking is, what are the clinical consequences of those two um, results? So improved cancer survival against patient anxiety, unnecessary further testing, potential harm and costs of the false positives so you're going to need to think about how you're going to weigh up that trade-off. What's the maximum false positives you tolerate for one additional, um, for one additional true positive? So sorry, error there. Okay, so the example here to show how you may go about doing that is the serum marker for ovarian cancer screening. And here, you're asking that question, what's the maximum false number of false positives you'd be prepared to tolerate for that extra? true positive result with your serum marker. And you can go through and think about, well, how many patients are you prepared to work up with further investigation um, to detect one true positive? So you're, work, you're working up two for one true positive, so you're, you just want to accept the work up of one false positive to one true positive, or working down, no. Um, I value the potential benefits of a true positive and the opportunity for earlier treatment higher, and I'm going to accept more. And how far do you want to go down? You can accept 10 more, 50 more, 100 more. And using that ratio that you're prepared to accept of the true positive and the false positive, you can set a minimal acceptable positive predictive value. So if it was I was prepared to just have one false positive for every true positive, it's set at 50%. And then moving down, if I'm prepared to accept 50 workups to identify that one true positive, then I'm going to be prepared to accept the positive predictive value of 2%. Now, just showing you that this has already been done, so these are established principles and the, um, uh, a guideline group um, you know, back over 10 years ago was thinking about this problem, about the performance characteristics for a screening marker for ovarian cancer, and was acknowledging that if the false, the harms of the false positive involved a laparoscopy, so an invasive procedure, that it seemed reasonable to only accept 10 workups for one true positive, and they set the positive predictive value at 10%. So you're, the way you're going to set that ratio depends entirely on what you're saying the consequences are of that false positive and what you know about the potential benefits of that true positive. With that information about your ratio and your minimal accepted positive predictive value, you can go ahead and calculate the minimum accepted um, sensitivity and specificity. So the information that you've got at this stage is you've got your acceptable trade-off, which may not everyone may agree with, but it's transparent. But you also now need the disease prevalence. And then you can use an equation, which I'm showing here, which is um, available in biostatistics journals, but also from Margaret Pepe in Clinical Chemistry in 2016. And because I don't think everybody with a positive serum marker test is going to have laparoscopy, 
I'm going to think some of them are going to go to ultrasound and maybe they'll be ruled out at that stage. I'm going to accept my ratio of working up 50. So I'm accepting 49 false positives for every true positive. positive. And that indicates that I'm valuing that false positive at 1 49th of a true positive. And then I'm going to use some population-based studies and set my prevalence actually quite high for this patient group of over 50-year-old women at 5 per 10,000. Then I'm going to put it in this formula and I'm going to calculate that that ratio of sensitivity and specificity is at 40, that's the positive likelihood ratio. But what that tells me is given my trade-off and given the prevalence of the condition, when I, when I use that calculation, it tells me, and I, and I also know that there's no existing test, so I don't even care about, you know, I'm willing to accept a very low sensitivity for this test, but I'm going to need to have a high specificity. So it's a sensitivity of 40%. To meet my trade-off, I need a specificity of 99%. If I want a higher sensitivity, um, I don't get that much of a benefit from the specificity. Moving on to the test, that are intended benefits that to rule out. So um, then you're looking at a trade-off for false negatives to true negatives. My example here is the high sensitivity troponin test to rule out acute coronary syndrome. And here the position of the test is a triage test. So there's no change in the clinical pathway for uh, patients testing positive. It's the patients testing negative where they're going, to be, they're going to have the condition ruled out and they go off the pathway, and then I'm thinking about the consequences of a true negative and the consequences of a false negative. So no further testing to reduce length of stay or risk of a major adverse event because I got it wrong. And thinking about how I would um, set that ratio, that trade-off. So the question would be, how many false negatives are you prepared to tolerate per 100 or 100,000 patients ruled out. And setting, using that ratio to set the minimum acceptable negative predictive value. So if I was setting it, um, I'm going to give you an example of how it was set um, by others. So here's a survey from Martin Fan, 2012. We asked ED, emergency department physicians, where would you set the threshold? And over half of them said, I'd set it at 1% or less than 1%. So that suggests a minimal acceptable negative predictive value of 99%. Okay, so what I've outlined is three approaches you can use to set minimal acceptable um, performance characteristics for your new test. And what we're suggesting um, that you would do is when you're running a performance study, you'd be using the STAR guidelines to report the results and using this approach to actually formulate your study hypothesis that clinical performance is sufficient for the intended benefits. And also using this approach to actually determine the sample size you needed for your study. And if you were in a situation where you weren't running the study, you were interpreting the results of the study, you were using the same process to discuss the clinical implications of the results. In which case, you have some evidence and you're thinking about the, whether the intended clinical benefits will it be achieved. So if your intended benefits are improved outcome and no trade-offs or other benefits, you're benchmarking to existing tests, you're demonstrating concordance, or you're demonstrating increased sensitivity, in increased specificity, no compromise, and, and those other benefits. If you're in the group and you're claiming improved disease outcomes, then the results are being interpreted about whether that trade-off is acceptable. So you're either going to set it or, or, or interpret the results that, you're sitting, that are sitting in front of you in terms of what that trade-off looks like. So is that, a trade, um, is that an acceptable positive predictive value? And if the intended benefits of the test are to rule out, so avoid unnecessary further testing, um, then you're presented with, um, with the situation where you're interpreting, well, what's the safety of using that test? In clinical terms, the consequences of those false negatives according to what your negative predictive value is. And of course, obviously, the test has got to assess some people as negative. Otherwise, you're not going to achieve any of your benefits of ruling out. So, um, to sum up, 
Um, using this approach gives you an opportunity for actually looking at the test accuracy and making conclusions about whether clinical performance is sufficient for intended use based on it exceeding those clinically defined minimum, minimal acceptable levels. And I've used very simple examples here, but the concepts apply to broader, um, broader types of tests, including complex or, or omics tests. But the caution that I wanted to say was this is um, necessary to, that your test would meet these requirements, but it may not be sufficient, so it's dependent on the conclusions about whether the test will actually improve benefits, I mean, improve outcomes. It depends on the certainty you have about the benefits for those true positives. And in the example of ovarian cancer screening, the subsequent trials that were done actually showed a real harm for those false positives, so serious outcomes for patients who then proceeded to surgery and were found not to have ovarian cancer and have yet to demonstrate the benefits of early detection. But then there are other situations where there's established evidence about the benefits of the true positive, say for thick of alcohol blood testing, where screening trials show those benefits of early detection. And also the benefits of avoiding colonoscopy. There's real harms to colonoscopy. So you can make more conclusive conclusions about patient outcomes. So I need to acknowledge um, everyone from the working group um, and to let you know that this work is now available um, online from the Analysis Clinical Biochemistry. Thank you.